Normally, the funeral of an IRA man in Londonderry attracts up to 4,000 people. Less than 50 turned up to bury him. Even in death, a man branded an informer is reviled. Paddy Flood was murdered by the IRA after a lengthy interrogation in which he admitted he'd been working for the police. His story highlights the murky side of Northern Ireland's undercover war. It shows how an informer is recruited by the security forces, the relationship he has with his handlers, and the grisly price he often pays for being a double agent. Informants in general is a dirty, unsavoury game and we don't like it. We're obliged to enter in, into it because of the threat we face and we'll continue to do so. Tonight, Spotlight looks at the rules and results of that dirty game. We show how the use of informers crippled the IRA and saved lives in Derry in the 80s. But we also reveal how double agents were involved in terrorist crime, including murder. And even though one section of the security forces had foreknowledge about planned IRA operations, the attacks went ahead anyway. And little appears to have been done to make arrests later. Paddy Flood joined the IRA in 1985. He was one of their heroes at Milltown. He led the charge on Michael Stone as the loyalist gunman continued firing at the funeral of the three IRA members shot dead in Gibraltar. Few who admired his actions would have guessed that even then he was working for the RUC. Paddy Flood became an informer because of love. In May 87, after surveillance, the police found weapons and explosives in a shed next door to Flood's house. He and his girlfriend Liz, later to become his wife, were arrested. During questioning, the police told him that Liz had broken under interrogation and admitted possession. She faced a long sentence. He was told that they were prepared to release her if he became an informer. He accepted the deal. The police and Paddy Flood then agreed an elaborate hoax to fool the IRA. Flood was charged with having the weapons and explosives and remanded in Crumlin Road Jail for several months. But shortly before he was due to go on trial, he was released because of lack of evidence. Flood was accepted back by the IRA as a bomb maker. Apart from his handlers, nobody knew he was a double agent. Paddy Flood was, I would say, one of the more frequent visitors down here. He frequently claimed that he was getting harassed, that he was being stopped in the street, being raided on his home and so on. In fact, he even he came down here, he was supposed to leave on his honeymoon and he was stopped from going by the police and held for 48 hours or something, as far as I recall at that time. So he, he was claiming a lot of harassment. Spotlight has been able to build up from a variety of sources a detailed picture of both Paddy Flood's IRA involvement and his relationship with his handlers. We've established that he had three pre-arranged meeting points with them in Derry. Woodburn, the corner of Nelson Drive and the railway station. His handlers were codenamed Mark and Phil. Flood was called Finn, an old schoolboy nickname. He was told to pass on only the more important pieces of information like planned attacks and not to bother with minor incidents like robberies. The police told him they were only interested in IRA activity in his area. No one would get hurt and no arrests would be made. We can also reveal that Flood was not the only informer in the IRA in Derry at that time. There was a second double agent, Pat Moore. Both men held high-ranking positions in the organization and both were involved in a planned landmine attack on an army patrol as it traveled up the Buncrana Road in January 89. Flood made the bomb and Moore, as quartermaster, transported it. There are certain people at the connections between different active service units, between different terrorist cells, who are vital to the smooth running of complex terrorist operations. The kind of people one, are to one is talking about would be uh, someone in the quartermaster's department because he or she might have to provide the weapons and the explosive at a particular time to particular individuals.
The IRA intended taking over a house on this estate and detonating the landmine from it. But when Flood and Moore approached the house, they realized no IRA unit was waiting for them. They aborted the operation. The unit met shortly afterwards and decided to bomb the Derry Courthouse instead. The device was quickly transformed from a landmine to an ordinary bomb by changing its firing mechanism. Moore drove it to the new target. This man knew Moore. Although he himself has never been a member of the IRA, he had knowledge of Moore's paramilitary involvement. He has been questioned by the police. Can you talk a bit about the, the circumstances that led to the bombing of the courthouse? I don't know a lot about it, it's just from what I've heard again, the bomb was to be used, wasn't used, to go to the courthouse. Was that the Buncranor Road bomb? Uh, from what I hear. Uh... And why would, it be, why would it have been taken to the courthouse? Good target, isn't it? Did he speak to you about the second attempt on the Buncrana Road or about the courthouse bomb? About the courthouse. Talked about the courthouse. And what did he say about the courthouse? About getting away through a checkpoint with a bomb. Was he surprised by that? Same story again. Good luck on it again. It's close up now. Do you think that he had the opportunity to warn the authorities about the attempt on the courthouse? Well, no, now that he was an informer, definitely. He's a boy going to be delivering the things, so therefore he's going to have knowledge of So they must have known. Pat Moore's bomb badly damaged the Church of Ireland Cathedral, St. Columns, and surrounding property owned by Protestants. It was seen as a sectarian attack. Even then, Questions were being asked. The van containing the explosives had been left in Bishop Street in full view of an observation post on the city's walls, fitted with security cameras. Today, local unionist politicians were asking how the bombers could leave the bomb and get away scot-free. And as it was the third attack on court premises in a matter of weeks, they believed the security forces should have taken action to prevent this bombing. It's obviously a lack of security. Uh, some face. Uh, as far as the courthouse is concerned. Uh, they have known for some time that attacks were going to take place uh, on places like the courthouse, on police stations, this type of thing. Uh, so a special effort has got to be made and should have been made to protect those places. After the courthouse bomb, the IRA again turned its attention to the Buncrana Road. The road links the Fort George Army base with a permanent border checkpoint at Kosh Quinn. Flood warned his handlers that the IRA was still planning a bomb attack on a mobile patrol as it travelled up the road. The operation went ahead two months later. A landmine was again used. Its bell wire ran along this pitch in line with these goalposts which acted as a marker. The security forces' two informers were again involved. They were part of a six-man team. Flood was given a day's notice to make a 400-pound bomb. Moore, as quartermaster, was also given advance warning about the planned attack. Moore was told he would have to transport the landmine concealed in two black bins to a drop-off point on the Buncrana Road. On the day of the operation, the security forces saturated the area, suggesting they had advanced knowledge of a possible attack. Both mobile and foot patrols passed up and down the road all day, but nothing happened. The IRA waited until dark before placing the device along the side of the road. Two IRA members with a detonator took up position beside the goalposts, about 200 yards from the landmine. They had less than half an hour to wait before an army patrol appeared. As the last vehicle in the convoy passed, the landmine exploded, killing two soldiers and injuring four others, too seriously.
Daylight revealed the horror of the explosion, which was heard up to five miles away. Stephen had a premonition, I'm sure he did, that something was going to happen on this patrol or on this tour duty, because he had never, ever left us a letter before. And he left us this letter with a poem. So I'm sure he knew something was going to happen. As some people do, don't they? They get these premonitions. Mm. As you did? As I did, yes. yes. Um, but the poem he left, the media generally, the press thought that Stephen was the originator of the poem. And he was known him nationally as the soldier poet, which touched a lot of people's hearts. Most people won't remember Stephen's name, of course, but I think there will be quite a number who remember the soldier poet. It began, do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. Spotlight has learned that Stephen Cummins and Miles Amos, the murdered soldiers, were members of a specialist unit. They were part of what's known as a cop, a close observation platoon. The army has told Stephen Cummins' father that they were on their way to ambush an IRA unit when they met their death. But one defense commentator believes that the army's intelligence was less than rock solid. There must have been doubts uh, about the uh, veracity or the reliability of that intelligence. The reason being that where there is certainty or near certainty about the reliability of information, I think it's much more likely that we would have seen the SAS or the uh, Army Surveillance Unit 14 Intelligence Company or one of the surveillance units of the RUC becoming involved in that operation. Even if the Army's intelligence was less than 100%, the key question remains. Why was a Land Rover patrol sent into such a dangerous area? We still don't know the answer to that because the army and the police have a policy of not commenting on informer stories. So unless someone is brought to trial, we may never know the extent of the security forces foreknowledge about the attack. Shortly after the bomb, the RUC launched a murder investigation. A police inspector told the inquests that despite exhaustive inquiries, no one has been charged in connection with the killings. It's still unclear whether Pat Moore and Paddy Flood, who were part of the murder gang, were interviewed as part of those inquiries. In April 89, shortly after the Buncranner Road murders, Pat Moore was arrested by the Gardaí in County Donegal and charged with the armed robbery of this pub. Moore, who was a compulsive gambler, raided the pub ostensibly looking for cash. When he appeared before the Special Criminal Court in Dublin, he pleaded guilty and was given a seven-year jail sentence but he served only four months. The Republic's former Justice Minister, Ray Burke, ordered his release without giving any explanation. Around that time, the Gardaí found a number of arms dumps near the border. And it's now believed that the information leading to the seizures on both sides of the border may have been provided by a man from Derry. He's being held in police custody in the Republic. His wife and children have left their home to stay with relatives. After his release from Limerick Jail, Moore and his family, with the help of both the British and Irish authorities, took refuge in the anonymity of England. But he has had to move house at least once because the IRA had tracked him down. Moore has contacted Spotlight. He claimed that the robbery on the Donegal pub and his subsequent arrest had been planned by him in conjunction with the RUC and the Gardaí because they feared his cover was about to be broken. If true, this raises potentially embarrassing questions, not just about the degree of cross-border security cooperation, but also about the extent double agents like Moore have a license to commit crime, including murder. The special branch officer is uh, in many ways dependent on his sources for his own or her own importance. Uh, handling a top-level source can make you. At the same time, many of them become very friendly with their sources. They come to identify with them very deeply uh, uh, and, and would be very reluctant to do anything which would endanger their life, even though they may have a pretty good inkling that their sources have been responsible for the murder of other police officers or soldiers. With Moore off the scene, the security forces still had Paddy Flood as an informer in the Derry area. But his time was also running out. In August 89, Flood took photographs of Derry City's walls for part of an IRA operation planned for the 20th anniversary of the arrival of troops on the streets. 
Paddy Flood instigated the operation. And he made a bomb which was to be hidden in a concrete block and disguised as part of the walls. The device was to go off at a point where soldiers and the police normally gather for such parades. What happened instead was an ambush by the security forces. On the evening of August 11th, Flood went to this house in Rathlin Gardens where two men were waiting to transport the bomb. The original plan was to move the device from the back of the house across playing fields. But Flood had earlier contacted his handlers. On their advice, he persuaded the two men to leave by the front instead. They drove into a trap. One of the RUC's elite units was waiting for them. The police rammed the two men's car before arresting Martin Malloy and Dave Doherty. Flood escaped. Malloy and Doherty were later given 10-year jail sentences. Doherty described to Spotlight what happened that evening while he was released from prison on compassionate leave. At the start, I thought it was, I took it as a DMSU of the area, but later found out it was a crack squad, Eve Corey, and the rest of us. The way they've come in on the job and the professionals of it, the no numbers on the shirts and carrying heavy and cock rifles. The Rathlin Gardens arrests give a good insight into how the security forces react once intelligence is received. They may choose that if it's what they call hard arrest, an exceptionally difficult arrest, that they will use the SAS to carry out the arrest. If they do so, they will usually have a police squad of the HMSU, as it's called the Headquarters Mobile Support Unit, or one of the other elite units of the RUC on hand to take custody of the people arrested almost as soon as the arrest has gone ahead. Sometimes they may decide that it simply isn't necessary to use the SAS and they will use the uh, headquarters mobile support unit, the special support unit or, or, or some other element to actually carry out the arrest. The police described the Rathlin Gardens bomb as particularly devious in the way it was camouflaged. Had it gone off, it would have caused large-scale injuries and death. But the device could not have exploded. Again, on the advice of his handlers, Flood had removed the batteries. He had undoubtedly saved lives. Paddy Flood was. Dave Doherty has confirmed to Spotlight that Paddy Flood was involved in the Rathlin Gardens operation. He says Flood made the bomb and told him it was primed and ready to go. To me, it was, I never suspected any Paddy Flood. It was just the feeling in the areas that there was something wrong. Once Malloy and Doherty were arrested in such a dramatic way, the IRA suspected an informer. Suspicion fell on Paddy Flood as the sole member of the gang to avoid arrest. But the IRA believed they needed a stronger case before confronting him. Sometime later, they discovered what they considered incriminating evidence. Extraordinarily, it was the authorities that helped point the finger of suspicion at Flood. Court deposition showed that the device had no batteries and had not been primed. Oddly, even though the IRA had this information, they were still prepared to give Flood the benefit of the doubt. A worried Flood went to his handlers and told them he felt betrayed by the arrests of Malloy and Doherty. But they persuaded him they had nothing to do with it. They said the decision to arrest the two was taken in Belfast and would never happen again. Flood was reassured. The bomb had been planted beside the old city wall, where security forces normally walk such parades. Four policemen, soldier and four civilians were hit by flying masonry. Six months after Rathlin Gardens, the IRA attempted a copycat operation. A device was again hidden in a concrete block disguised as part of the city walls. As a Bloody Sunday commemoration march passed by, the bomb exploded, killing Charles Love, a Sinn Féin member. Flood claimed that though he had warned his handlers about the plan, they had done nothing. But the IRA's case against Flood was mounting. In June 1990, a senior figure in the Republican movement contacted him and asked him to make an anti-personnel landmine. A foot patrol was again the target. Flood contacted his handlers. He told them where the bomb was being made. Shortly afterwards, the SAS moved into position 
along this alleyway close to Marlborough Terrace. Three men were arrested in the laneway, allegedly on a bombing mission. The three who deny the charge are currently on trial. When it emerged that the SAS were involved in the Marlborough Terrace operation, Flood went to his handlers and told them they had left him high and dry. Paddy Flood's luck had finally run out. The IRA were now convinced that he was an informer. Two major operations in which he'd been centrally involved had been stymied by the security forces, who were clearly acting on high-grade intelligence. Three weeks after the SAS arrests, he disappeared from Derry. He was taken to South Armagh, where he was interrogated for over seven weeks before what the IRA calls a court-martial, but what others would call a kangaroo court. It wasn't long before he admitted he was an informer. Flood's fate was sealed. As a senior member of the IRA, he was aware that the punishment for informing was death. On the evening of July 26, 1990, a woman out for a walk in South Armagh discovered his body lying on the side of the road. Flood left a widow who disputes that he was an informer and a young daughter. They left Paddy's body on the country roadside. And they, they'd taken every identity off him. He was lying with a bullet suit. He had a black plastic bag over his head. And he was bare, barefooted. And his ha hands tied behind his back. And they, he was shot with a high philosophy bullet. And the, his coffin wasn't even opened. I couldn't even say goodbye to my husband. It puts a, an awful lot of strain on the family. Because... Whereas people will ignore you on the streets. And like, I have to bring my wee girl up and I, she has to go to school and she will get things thrown at her about her father. And like she's an innocent victim in this case. Always opening his parcel. Derry City at the mouth of the foil. The river divides the overwhelmingly Catholic West Bank from the predominantly Protestant waterside. The Catholic side has a population of 55,000 but no policeman or UDR soldier lives there. Surveillance alone is insufficient against the IRA here. The fact that the REC have very little sources of information, or have very few sources of information in this area. Like, this is a fairly big city and absolutely no security force, domestic presence to come in from the outside to police it. None of the policemen live here. None of the soldiers obviously live here. They're not mixing in the ordinary community, therefore they have no access to ordinary information. Therefore they're dependent on information from paid informers. The IRA in Derry have been infiltrated by at least seven alleged informers since the 80s. It's estimated that one in nine members of the organization was a double agent. The result, there was relatively little paramilitary activity in the city. So little, it was embarrassing for the leadership. It seems to have been pretty much the weakest within the entire provisional structure in terms of its ability to resist informers. So in the 1980s, you've got something like half a dozen people at least that we know about, actually active frontline members of the IRA, not just sympathizers, but gunmen, bomb makers, informing. And the effect of that was to reduce the level of violence in the city uh, quite considerably. Now, exactly how much, one can argue. Clearly, the IRA itself changed strategy during those years. But compared to the 1970s, the number of members of the security forces killed, for example, did drop as a result of these informers. The use of informers has been successful in curbing paramilitary violence. But as we have seen, it confronts the security forces with dilemmas. How do they protect their members without compromising the identity of their agents? Another key question in the running of informers is which branch of the security forces controls intelligence on a daily basis. Once Brian Nelson, the loyalist double agent, was sentenced earlier this year, the government announced another review of how the intelligence services share and use information. That review is likely to concentrate on establishing effective guidelines for handlers on the running of double agents. Home Office rules state that informers must not take part in or instigate crime. They also say that the need to protect an informer does not justify granting immunity from prosecution or arrest. The Flood and Moore cases 
show that those rules do not appear to apply to Northern Ireland. The main aim of the review, I think, will be to try and improve the way that intelligence from informers is handled and dealt with and used. And I think they're going to be looking at many things. For example, do they still need to have three main agencies, the RUC, the Army and MI5, running agents? Is the uh, job of director and coordinator of intelligence, which has traditionally been an MI5 post, uh, a good, uh, the right thing to have? Does the DCI have enough power? Should it continue to be an MI5 officer? I think all those questions are going to be looked at. Whatever emerges from the review, one thing is clear. The search for and use of informers, unsavoury though it is, will continue. And while some lives will be saved, others will be condemned to a lonely road in South Armagh with a bullet in the head.